a little background on this, the topic itself. You've received a printout, it's six Gita values, and there's a little history behind how that came about. I first heard about it um, from a devotee named Adi Purusha, who is a, a teacher of Bhagavad Gita. He teaches systematic study of Bhagavad Gita for the past dozen years or so, uh, based in, I think, based in Vrindavan. And he came to the, the Washington, D.C. temple and made a presentation on Gita values. That's how I heard about it first. But where it came from, I didn't know, and here's the, where it came from. One of our uh, senior devotees named Shesha Prabhu was um, about to become the chairman of the, the GBC, the Governing Body Commission chairman. And you might not be surprised, there's no job description. And so he was thinking, because he's a deep thinking person, what am I supposed to do? I didn't ask that question when I became chairman. I just, I asked someone who I looked up to and what am I supposed to do? So he went a little further. He approached um, a few scholars like Adi Prusha and, and you know, what's, what is it, what's the, the principles by which I'm supposed to lead as the leader of the, the chairman of the GBC? So that led to a series of other discussions, some professors at Oxford University, and some people, and some people, and some people, and they got together saying, well, the, the principles should be drawn from Bhagavad Gita. And they sat together and crafted together some, what you have a copy of, six principles. And um, then it became a, a, a course that Adi Purusha taught because he was one of the participants in creating it. So it's, it's life leadership messages. What are principles by which you should, one, one may want to live their life, taken from Bhagavad Gita. Then they called it Gita values. Now, a little understanding about <clears throat> spiritual culture and its values. There's a, another devotee I know um, who has a PhD in organizational development. Nice PhD. You know, he's a devotee, so he was interested in using that PhD training so he could help. He's not. He, He's not a leader per se, but he's very knowledgeable in the matter. Um, and so he showed us this image that I liked. There's different images that deal with the iceberg of culture, but it goes like this. Not only a particular person that's going to take a leadership position, but anybody. Supposing, for example, there's a corporation that buys out another corporation. And one of the first things they do is they look at the culture of the organization that was and then go through an exercise of trying to understand what do we want it to be because now we, it's our business or our, our, our company or our, our corporation. So they look at this kind of a diagram and like an iceberg, there's the tip of the iceberg and there's a big part of the iceberg below. So the iceberg of culture goes, there are things that you can perceive and, and even sometimes measure. Behaviors, something that comes in touch with the senses, it's that part of culture is that's perceivable. I mean, just like walking into this place that Sarah has set up, there's a certain ambience to the place that's unique. And so that's a certain culture that's meant to create a feeling in the people that come here. So that's the perceivable part. And then there's what's behind the perceivable part. That's the values that 
the, the behaviors and the measurable things are manifesting. It manifested from values. That's where the topic Gita values. And behaviors can help shape values and values certainly drive behaviors. So there's an interplay between them in this iceberg of culture. And at the very bottom of the iceberg is deeply held beliefs, unchanging realities that just has nothing to, because values can change and behaviors can change, but some things don't change. And the iceberg of culture has to factor in all three. Psych, for example, an unchanging reality from Bhagavad Gita as we're spirit soul. And that's one of the values. It's, it's, it's woven through all six of the values. So that's an unchanging certainty that just doesn't... So, because Gita values is focusing on values, we're going to look at values, but values are resting upon assumptions and they manifest in the form of behaviors also. That's just like a, a little background on the Gita values message. And then there's another distinct, two more distinctions. One more distinction is there's wisdom and knowledge that's wisdom-like and then there's knowledge that's just information. And within Bhagavad Gita there's both. But the, the focus is wisdom, not just information. Here's a little example. Something like, I don't know, eight years ago or so, the government of India, the educational departments of India had a conference in Delhi. And the keynote speaker began by saying, education in India today can be summed in four words. Information, information, five words. Information, no transformation. Because real education is character development or transforming a person into a better person, whether it's ch a, a child or, or any, any adult education or any education. There's information content, yes. But if it stops with information, it doesn't bring transformation, it's not complete. So the whole conference was on that topic, and the end is they made available some, um, I forget what you call it, like some reward or an incentive. Persons that could come up with curriculum, they didn't want to call it spirituality, they just, so they called it character development curriculum for their education systems at different levels and people that could come up with those and they approved their education board, then they would adopt it in their education systems. So many devotees got involved in value education, they called it. Just a euphemism. You don't want to call it spiritual. So value education. Because when there's value, then behaviors will more likely correspond with the values and not just information. So, there's information in, in this presentation and in Bhagavad Gita, but it doesn't stop there. When, when we speak of knowledge, when Bhagavad Gita speaks of knowledge, it means realization, jnana, big jnana. Astikyam, Brahma Karma Swabhavajam. Okay, then in presenting this to different audiences, I, I uh, felt important to encourage particularly new audiences because one of the places that I in the past have presented this to is college audiences. I don't want to intimidate them that here's something that's so high it's out of reach. It's, it's appropriate that we have an honest recognition of where we are. It's also important to know where we want to go. 
you don't know where you want to go, how are you going to get there? In your GPS, you have to put in where you want to go, and the GPS can tell you how to get there. But if you don't know where you want to go, how are you going to get there? In my undergraduate days in college, I had a friend that had um, a little sports car, a convertible sports car. And in, in those days, that was like nobody had those things. You know, now it's more common, but it was really unique. And I found out from him later that every Saturday, he went for a ride in the country. And I asked him, when you get in your car and you go for a ride to the country, where are you going? And he said, I'm just going for the ride. And I said, I hope you get there. <laughs> or in America, you're all American, so the little children's rhyme, row, row, row your boat, gently down the stream, merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Don't, don't worry about where you're going because life is but a dream anyway. It's just row, row, row your boat. Just, you know, live your life. And do, if you don't have an idea of what's, what's, what's the purpose or mission or given the gift of the human form of life, what are you supposed to do with it anyway? And if you don't know, you're going to make something up. Many people make something up and that's their goal. But Bhagavad Gita gives us a sense of the destination by design when one receives the human form of life. What's the mission? And if you look at the mission and see what the goal is, it may be far away. And that big space in between where we are and where we want to go may be a big space, generally. Especially if you have the right idea of what, if you're self-honest, and if you have the right idea of what the human mission is. So a phrase that I learned from Sachinandana Swami, because he also speaks to new audiences all the time, he uses this phrase liminal space. I thought it was pretty cool because he's, he's German. And I didn't know what liminal means, so I had to look it up. Liminal means in between this and that. Like, for example, in architecture, a liminal space is a patio. It's neither inside nor outside. Like the place where Lord Dushingadev killed Rani Kashipu. It was on the patio. It was neither inside nor outside. Or in carpentry, when there's a doorway to seal the door and the floor below the doorway, there's this little board that goes across. It's called the limen. It's neither this nor that. The liminal space is when you're transitioning between where you are and where you want to go. It's, it's a, it can be uncomfortable. It's like being a teenager. You're, 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 you're dependent and then you become independent and in between is becoming independent. It's uncomfortable. Teenage life is generally, you know, it has its discomforts. So in the course of transitioning from where we are to where we want to go, the good news is Krishna is there, especially when the, the practice is bhakti, Krishna is there helping every step. If one forgets Krishna is there, it can get a little uncomfortable. But if Krishna, if that consciousness of Krishna is helping one go to where one wants to go, that's the right idea of yoga, and that's the right idea of Bhagavad Gita. And this is the last little graphic, I like this one. And when we're moving towards that goal, it's sometimes kind of makeshift. <laughs> kind of like what the schedule's been like since I came here to Syracuse. And, you know, when did you know that we were coming here, Sarah? A few days ago? No, last month. KG and Karuna, after they visited once, they said we'd like to bring um, the sacred individual to your place. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing that because I didn't know until two days ago. <laughs> but I'm happy to be here. Nice, nice, very nice space, nice gathering. 
So when we're, when we're going to where we want to go, it's sometimes you have to be a little creative and trusting in Krishna, and it's a big adventure. But some people like adventure. So here's the first of the Gita values that this group of um, thoughtful people came up with. It's taken directly from a verse of Bhagavad Gita, Pandita Samadarshana. Many of you are familiar with the verse. Pandita is a learned person, and Samadarshana is sama, seeing equal. Darshan is to see, or equal vision. So that's the first of, in their list of Gita values. And there's a challenge in equal vision. And the cha- one of the challenges is there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of diversity. For example, I've never seen a fruit tree like this, but <laughs> trees bear, bear, fruit trees bear different fruits. And insects are so much variety. And birds are so much variety. Fish are so much variety. Animals are so much variety. More animals are so much variety. There's a lot of differences out there. So how are you supposed to do the Samadarshana program, equal vision, when there's so much variety? Or amongst people, cultures, languages, etc., etc., etc. There's so much variety in nationalities, nations, the United Nations, so many flags. So, so many differences. Where's the equal vision fit in? How do you do it? Practically, realistically. And even amongst just people from basically the same culture, they, re- they have different reactions to the same thing. You know, perception and emotion related to the same phenomena that they experience. So, challenge. How are we going to see there's, with it, all these differences, different forms of life, different people, different situations, different exchanges, how are we supposed to do this? How to see with equal vision? Now, most of you know Bhagavad Gita, so you already know the answer. And this little graphic is showing there's a lock in the shape of a heart, there's a key, and Bhagavad Gita gives the key to open that lock. The Gita's idea of equal vision speaks of the equality of all living beings where life is respected regardless of the differences. At at one time there was a a, a nice little, I don't know what you call it, little video showing this slide is from that video. these, These were sparkling little sparks and is meant to show those are souls. So there, there's souls within all the different species of life. This is meant to show the evolutionary cycle from aquatics and so forth and so on. And all of these things floating around, that's the souls that are floating around. We can't see them, but there's souls, sarvagata in the language of Bhagavad Gita. There's souls everywhere. And that's the commonality, is the, the presence of the soul. The eternal, unchanging spiritual energy. So if that is the consciousness, the recognition of the entity with, covered by so many different varieties, then the varieties are there, that's fine. And the sameness is also there, that's fine. All living beings are spirit souls. So then, what's a spirit soul? So Bhagavad Gita gives us this understanding. The spiritual soul is Satchitananda, eternal, cognizant, and blissful. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. And the, the coverings are resting upon that. No. We can go further and say souls are also different. Spiritual form is also different. Spiritual personality is also different.
But the differences that mostly we're tuned into is the coverings and how they're different. So one way of saying this is we're not human beings having a spiritual experience, we're spiritual beings having a human experience. And this little presentation was put together long ago and subsequently I came across this little interview from TikTok and I hope technology works because this fellow being interviewed says the same thing. Oh, it's not working. Hang on. I have to do this. Excuse me. It should work. Fooey. I did a dry run and it was working fine before you all came in. And then you came in. <laughs> I don't know what to do. The reason why spirituality is important is because it is reality. That we are not human beings having a spirit. I can restart it sometimes. You're having what? It'll work. It'll work now? You're the technology lady, huh? No, I just touched the cable. I think it was this. Huh? I just touched the cable. I think it was this. It's not playing now. And now the, now the sound isn't working. Well, you heard the sound. I'm hearing it. You're hearing it out of that thing? What about this? A little yeah. spark yeah. that the divine inside of me. Something. There's hard data. Let's go back. It has its own uh, The reason why spirituality is important is because it is reality. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Who I am and what I am is not my body. It's not even my personality. You know, it's not the trauma I suffered. It's not what I have been through that there is a little spark of the divine inside of me. There's hard data that shows around mental health and well-being that having serenity, meaning, purpose, a losing of oneself to a transcendent self of the divine increases greatly the quality of our lives. We're a part of something much greater, much more beautiful than ourselves, and in living in that state can greatly enrich your life. A short video clip, and now you could hear it. You could all hear it? Yeah. Okay, good. Same message. Now, how to help people in different levels of their education and their self-identity understand? There was, um, before the pandemic, it was, a, it was a common thing. It's starting to ha happen again. It happened when it, it was just recently in Houston. A whole group of students came from University of Houston. They were in, um, doing a research paper for world religion studies. But anyway, commonly, uh, I learned this from groups that come. The, the high school and college groups would often come to our temple because they were studying different religions and they like to come when we're doing rituals from their perspective, we're doing rituals because I learned this from them. The teacher teaches the difference between this one and that one is the rituals. I mean, there are differences of rituals. That's the, uh, the tip of the iceberg part. So they like to come when we're doing rituals. So they, they would commonly come at seven o'clock in the morning this is, you know, all over the country. So they, at 7 o'clock in the morning, we do one of our rituals in our temples. 
the pujari comes in front of the, the altar where the, the curtain is closed and they blow a conch shell. It's a nice ritual, three times. And then the curtain opens and everyone bows down. That's another ritual, bowing down ritual. And then the pujari in the temple rings a bell and offers some incense, you know, waves some incense in circles, and that's another ritual. And Jamuna's voice is in the background playing, singing, Go Vindamadi Purusham Tamaham Bajami, two, two verses. We pay obeisances three times before the three altars, and we go to the back of the temple room and do the, another ritual. We do Guru Puja. They like that one. And then we sit down after Guru Puja, and we have another ritual, sing Jai Radha Madhava and give a Bhagavatam class. So, for those groups of people, then comes a talk. And one of the things that I've, I like to do is, depending upon the age group, particularly younger kids, who's, is the, who's the smartest kid in the room here? You're all students. Who's the smartest kid in the room? And everybody knows who the smartest kid in the room is. They point to the smartest kid in the room. And so now they're in the hot seat. So do you mind if I ask you a few questions? Sure, no problem. I know how to get A's in exams, no problem. So uh, point to your head, point to your knee, point to your shoulder, point to your foot. Now point to you. And sometimes they go like this. And sometimes they just point to their chest. That's me. And, but wait a minute. That's my head, my foot, my arm, my shoulder. There's the object and there's the possessor of the object. You're the possessor of the object. Now, who are you and where are you? Point to, point to you. It's to help them get the idea that we're a soul within the body. Because that's a starting point. We had this discussion in the morning class. It's a starting point for people to get an idea of spirituality. Because if you don't have an idea of the soul, how can you have a, a spiritual idea about life and how to live life. You'll have something else, and you might call it spiritual, but it's not what real spiritual is if you don't know who you are. After Srila Prabhupada established Krishna consciousness in New York, there was a, there's a little video, an audio clip of a, a New York Post radio interview with Srila Prabhupada saying something to the effect, Swamiji, um, could you please tell our audience what the purpose of human form of life is? Prabhupada, to know yourself. Pause. To know yourself. Prabhupada, to know yourself. And you unpack to know yourself and you get Bhagavad Gita or you get wisdom or you get the self is part of something bigger like this fellow was saying. We're part of something much bigger. And if you don't know that something much bigger then you don't really know yourself. So, but, so the starting point is this the soul which is so powerful pervades and gives life to the gross and subtle body. And the soul is very tiny, according. This is in purports of Bhagavad Gita, but this reference from Svetashvatara Upanishad, you're all familiar with this one, when the upper point of a hair is divided into 100 parts, and again, each of such parts is further divided into 100 parts, each such part is the measurement of the dimension of the spirit soul, which is subatomic, and so you can't measure it. Besides the spiritual, you can't measure it. But it's very, very tiny. And that very, very tiny soul 
is the same size in an elephant as a, as a s small squirrel. So that's who we are, that real tiny spark. Here's a nice verse from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15. The living entity, thus taking another gross body, obtains a certain type of ear, eye, tongue, nose, and sense of touch, which are grouped about the mind. And thus he enjoys a particular set of sense objects. So the soul moves and transmigrates from one body to the next body and acquires a set of senses grouped around the mind. And in the human form of life, the senses are all well developed. And so people find happiness in trying to be the enjoyer of the object of the senses, and that's called material life. And spiritual life is to understand who we are. Even in different bodies, every living entity is an amazing spirit soul. But souls are covered with different coverings. And according to the modes of nature, this is, as you see in the bottom right corner from Bhagavad Gita chapter 3, text 38, coverings are compared to like the embryo covered by the womb, like a tree, mode of ignorance, mode of passion, is compared to the mirror covered by dust, less covered than a tree, or in the human form of life, compared to um, fire covered by smoke. Coverings, covering, coverings. But the, the soul is the foundation. The, the soul is the samadarshana principle. So it's, it's fine to make distinctions of differences because there are differences of coverings. But not, that's not the essence of me or another person or another entity or another species. It's not the essence. And Bhagavad Gita value wants us to have this stage where we can see Samadarshana. There is the verse again. The humble sage. That's this fellow here. He's the humble sage. And he's, by virtue of true knowledge, he sees with equal vision a learned and gentle Brahmana. There's a cow. There's a dog. There's an elephant. There's a fellow I wouldn't want to meet, a dog eater, chasing after the dog. And each one has this little spark within. And that little spark within is the entity, the real self. And so one can see differences despite differences of coverings. One can see, excuse me, sameness despite differences of coverings. This vision awards personhood to all links everyone with the divine grace and consequently with each other. Gita values. Almost done. Equal vision begins with seeing ourselves as what we are and seeing other living entities as who they truly are. Samadarshana. Okay, so here's a discussion piece of our activity here. And we can do it as a group where we can break into little the, the small groups of two, three people, something, three, four people, something like that. What are some challenging situations where you feel that you cannot see different people with equal vision? Think of one person in your life with whom you have difficulty now or in the past. This invites the audience. Write it down. I think it's nice to have a little discussion. Write down the incident and how you felt at that time. With your inner vision, consciously see that person as spirit, soul, aside from their behavior, their spirit, soul, and discuss in a small breakup group what you experienced. I remember doing this at um, Illinois Institute of Technology. You know, 
these are technology kids, mostly Indian, mostly grad student Indian, so you know, smart, cultured people, but they've also had some difficulties with people because that's life in this world. And the feedback I got afterwards was this time that they spent was most, was very meaningful. So it can be more meaningful for this group too because you're all thoughtful people and you know Bhagavad Gita and you probably have difficulties with some relationships as we all do. Is it okay? We can take groups of two or three or four, whatever you're like, and have, you know, 10 minutes or so discussion in your little group. When you're ready, find some people you want to sit with and have some discussion. And if you like, at the end, we can invite some sharing. Budger, get into the discussion. Stop playing with your camera.
Try to finish up in another minute, and we'll then invite you to share if somebody wants to share your group discussion. Focus again into our larger group. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. So this group is, I think, the most active group in the, the, of the three. Is there somebody from the most active group that would like to share, or maybe even two people from this active group? Something about your discussion? She's gesturing to you. You're on the hot seat. The, uh, being here in Auburn, I had to think of my mother. child and um, there's much to be thankful for there's also if we're stuck in our own little mind you know something to be angry about mm. um, and if we can get out of our own headspace you know rem and remember a sort of meditative distance um, we can go back to a reset where here we are it's not angry um, not is challenged but just giving ourselves space um, <laughs> they threw me into this I don't know what I'm saying <laughs> we all had a kind of collective parental and co-worker and really? a lot of parent kind of I guess you could say trauma <laughs> mm. um, in different ways but we all were saying that actually because a lot of us are familiar with you say that um, that you know we understand now that it's just the role we're playing in this life, you know, that we're all spirit souls and we just happen to be the daughter or the son and they happen to be the mother or the father for whatever karmic reasons or like that. But just knowing that we can see them more, more neutrally and we can appreciate where they're at and how they... I've got a name for it, detached caring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then um, all of my anger and frustration and irritation turns to love, wishing them well, respect, um, awe, um, seeing them as like a brother or sister instead of like an adversary. Mm. 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 
Spiritual conception is a nice place of shelter. Gives respite from the mind. In the, both the plus and the minus. Both. It's reality. How about this group back here? Someone like to share? Uh, we just spoke of like work relationship. Work. Because it can always be challenging, um, you know, with people you don't necessarily know other than in a work environment. And there's always somebody who's higher up who, you know, you're both kind of catering to or whatever. So there's, you know, there's going to be a lot of schism. Going to be what? Tension? Yeah, and competition, you know, within a workplace environment. Um, and then what's about the spiritual conception part? Well, just still seeing that, you know, realizing that that person isn't necessarily you know, just your coworker, you know, that is a spirit soul, and you're a spirit soul. And you're both kind of here for more than just your little work game. Take it with you, t you know, next week into the workplace. And see how how it plies. The sea is still going to be rough, but you know, there's the journey, the spiritual journey, and hunker down to the spiritual journey. That you know, that knowledge and practical applied knowledge. Gana vigyana. So at least conceptually, all this little exercise is saying conceptually, if you see that disruptive or abrasive or uncomfortable, whatever it is, relationship with a different lens, Samadarshana can, can help in a lot of ways. Not, not, not having a troubled mind and instead having intelligence operating in how do I navigate this situation. Okay, our group over here was pretty lively too. We had a lot of very similar themes as far as family, co-workers and that sort of thing. Yeah. A lot about um, difficulty meeting people sort of where they're at and not, you know, trying to show them everything at once or teach them that they're a spirit soul if they're not ready for it. But um, it, I, I personally will kind of tie it up in, um, I have a lot of, issues seeing people on equal playing fields where I feel like somebody is choosing to stagnate. Choosing to stagnate. When they have when they have other options available or even if it's not like the highest option, you know, there's I have people in my life and I know uh, people have people in their lives that um, aren't even choosing an option to move forward even if it's not the highest. They don't seem to be moving anywhere and they seem sort of content staying stuck Whew. where they are and so I have a difficulty what do you that. that's a deep difficulty because they, they are a spirit soul they are another human being and they're doing the best that they know how but there there seems to be at some point like a, it's it's like a caring disappointment like you, you could be doing much better for yourself and you know it at some level so I, I don't know, I have struggles with that. Because it, it does seem like, even at a spirit soul level, to be to be seeking betterment, even in a way that might ne not necessarily be the highest, is is better in some ways. You know? I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, it makes sense, but now, what's the practical application of this Samadarshana Gita value? Practical application, please. Not sure. And it could be a, a lesson about my own expectations. Of yeah. Lives. And then? So That's the lesson. Now what? What's the practical application? Accepting. Huh? Accepting. Yeah. That's, that's a, by the way, that's another one of the six Gita values, by the way. You'll see as we get there. But you've got this little handout so you can look it over later. Here, there's several things I'll respond I, 
what you said is very succinctly expressed by Prahlad Maharaj in his prayers to Lord Dev. For me, I have no worry, but my, but you know, my, I do have an anxiety. You know, it's similar to what you, you know people that are just caught in a suffering condition and they don't even know that they're suffering and they think it's enjoyment. It's it's very sad. So that's painful to me. So you joined the Prahlad Maharaj Club. And so what to do on the Samadarshana platform? One, be an example, because that's powerful. That can help people that, you know, you can provide light and they want to stay under a rock and you can't change that, but you can just continue to be an example, acharya-like principle. Another is prayer. Another, a third, is continue to show kindness even if there's no response. And, and something registers when you just continue to show wholesomeness and kindness and good example. People start to understand, some people are start to understand, this person cares and moves hearts when they know that somebody cares. Because one of the things that causes people to be stuck is nobody cares and I'm feeling lonely and, you know, the violin comes out. It's just what it is, so I'm, I'm stuck. So it, it just continued to extend. I do that a lot. I mean, as much as I could and should, but over a period of time, a little light comes on. A little, you know, sometimes, a real little one. That says, you know, you care. They're acknowledging there's some care. And consistent, consistent, consistent. Not overwhelming, just... And then, then, then that, that, that means when they, sh they share that, they open the door to let a little more light in or a little more something in besides darkness and being stuck. So that's something, those are, uh, see on the platform of spirit soul. Without, it, without attachment, this is this detached caring principle. That you know, sends Krishna's mercy into their life too. That's what you can do. And acceptance. That's, it is what it is. And you know, my heart says what my heart says. That's also. So that's something. Now, but I want to do something. How about anyone else here in this group? Yes. Yeah, so this is different what like we discussed. Yes. So the main thing is like I'm a student, so I have a lot of friends that like it's from India, from US, like I have a lot of friends, right? So mostly in India like you think like students or parents and everyone are too spiritual. But after coming here I've observed one thing that people uh, like to party a lot, they need to smoke, drink and everything, like not like everyone, even my roommates, some of my roommates does that. So the main thing here is like how do I apply equal vision? Because like our values doesn't match us. It's like mm -hmm. if, if, if I tell like to like sometimes, I also invite them to Mantra Central, it's on Sundays and everything like Wednesday, Sunday. So they said like, no, we have a party this Wednesday, so I won't be able to come. And also sometimes there's a lot of differences between them. Sometimes they are very good. So there are equal values. So there it, it seems like, like, yes, I can see them equally. But sometimes on the next moment, they talk about doing party, eating meat. And like, st there's a, like, on like, it's a flick, flick where your views change about them. So it's very difficult to, apply equal vision nowadays yeah. how how to achieve that that's more important for me because you have to stay with them for a long time mm. 
Life has challenges, doesn't it? Well, likely, for sure, not likely, for sure, time, will, the kaleidoscope will move. Time will change things. So what's important for you, two things, hold your, your you know, this spiritual sense of who you are and be a little, be aware of the principle of association means their qualities are likely to become your qualities if you're not clear of who you are. So you don't have to be judgmental about what they're up to, but, you know, be who you are. They don't have to be who you are, but you don't have to be who they are either. And, and the kaleidoscope will change. Time will move circumstances than what they are today. And in course of time, especially if you hold true to who you are, and it's in a, in a you know, mode of good, let's say, mode of goodness sense of who you are, or a spiritual sense of who you are, then facility will be given for you to be in a different kind of company. Likely. Not, not, you know, it's not a guarantee, but most likely that's how nature works. So like about judgment you told. So that's, that's the, it's like, it's the first thing like when you talk to a person or when you, when you try to have equal vision, but the first thing the brain does is to like judge yeah, what's of course. sitting in front of you. It okay. always judges first. Okay, we're conditioned souls. Yeah. Welcome so. to the club. That's most difficult to overcome. Okay, so continue reading Bhagavad Gita and make your best effort to apply the principles of Bhagavad Gita, and then you bec then you become less judgmental and more seeing through the eyes of knowledge. You, you follow? That's probably what you told him. Something like that. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not as good as you. <laughs> There's a difference between judgmentalism and knowledge. Krishna has knowledge and he's not judging this mode, that mode, this behavior, that behavior, the connect with this mode, that mode. He's seeing through the eyes of knowledge. So, you know, you're getting a, a first-hand Srimad Bhagavatam class in the form of the modes of nature. Oh, look at this mode, isn't that interesting? Look at that mode. Look at, you know, and, and then how the modes move. So, so through knowledge there's detachment. It's, it's a standard Vedic couplet, jnana vairagya. You know, jnana vairagya. So through knowledge there's detachment. So see through the knowledge, the lens of knowledge. And you're in anticipation of the kaleidoscope changing, because I really don't want to become be, because there's another principle in Bhagavad Gita, Sangat Sanjayate Kama. You, you, one, a living entity, takes on qualities like those with whom one associates. So I, yeah, I'm, I'm clear, I want to stay in the pr principle of not taking on those qualities. Let me see those qualities through the lens of knowledge and aspire for association that's wholesome. Use that word. Not just like, but wholesome, so I can become elevated. But you know, th then make sure you stay on the spiritual samadarshana platform. That's a challenge, no question about it. But it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Supposing it's like-minded people, and you're not seeing spirit soul either. I just I feel more comfortable in this association than that association. You're not necessarily evolving spiritually by feeling more comfortable. Right? Yep. Yep. Thank you. Hang out with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you want to say something? I, I was, uh, you were talking about, like, you know, the Sama Darshana, right? Uh, it's like such a high goal. It's a high goal. Yeah. Yes. And it makes me think of, uh, like, the, you know, the levels of Adhikar in uh, spiritual life where you have, you know, the, the beginning spiritual practitioner who might see only God in a certain way. And yeah, 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 yeah. 
and then you know the Madhyam who wants to share. We had a lot of people who in our group who really wanted to share and uh, help others. Yes. And they struggled with that, but and then of of course the Uttama Adhikari they see Krishna and everyone everything and they have that Samadarshana right. Yeah. yeah. But in the progress to get there, you know, isn't there? Uh, I, I I think I was hearing in uh, Jaiva Dharma there is. Right, there is a place where we could not necessarily harshly judge, but we can, we have to discriminate. Oh, yeah. Them. Knowledge is the tool for discrimination, discernment, this, that, and the other. That's, you know, your light's on, your discernment. That's not judging, that's discernment. That's a, a, you know, a pandita means a learned person, pandita samadarshana. They have knowledge, so they can discern this from that. So there's the differences, and there's the list, the dog, dog eater, that's a big difference. An elephant, a brahmin. So there's differences, I can see the differences. But I can see the spirit soul within. Now yes, it's elevated, but it's, that's at least on the platform of knowledge, conceptual knowledge, and then as I apply the concept in practical ways, then it becomes realization. It becomes how I see and experience. That's, that's how Bhagavad Gita, it, it, it's like osmosis, it kind of goes into your system through sound. And the application of that sound, it be, then it becomes your realization and how you live your life. Yes, there's stages, and it's easier said than done both but you know the, the introduction to Bhagavad Gita let's say a newer person the introductory person that's a nice concept that's a high concept that means that's what we're hearing from him especially when there's the, the differences are so stark and not only stark but you know I don't want it I was trained, and my, my nature is other than that, so that, anyway, then you have to start making choices. Find association that's wholesome, invest time in wholesome association, and you stay fixed in knowledge as you're going through that kaleidoscope picture. Okay, I think it's time.